second reflection of this Holy Week, Tuesday, 7th of April. You're almost welcome if you've uh, not journeyed before this Holy Week journey. Um, you're all welcome. It began on Palm Sunday as Jesus entered into Jerusalem. And here, last night, today and tomorrow, we will reflect on his last days, his last week, and we will join together on Maundy Thursday, Good Friday, and then we will wait and watch on Saturday to come into rejoicing on Easter Sunday, the holy journey of Easter. Before we begin, let's say a short prayer. As we come together this evening, we ask to grow in understanding and to deepen our journey into the mystery of God's love and grace as we walk with Jesus to the cross of love and life. Amen. All right. I'm just going to put this mic on to make it easier for people to hear. And we are basing, uh, centering our reflections on around a book by Stephen Cottrell called The Things He Did. And on this second day, we are looking at how Jesus washed his disciples' feet and how he broke bread and shared wine with them. And as I said, this is the last week of Jesus life and what has he done so far this week as we said he's entered into Jerusalem on a donkey so that he can fulfill the prophecy by Zechariah that he was the new Messiah he's overturned the tables in the temple shouting my house shall be called a house of prayer but you are making it a den of robbers and after that he continues to draw crowds to him healing on the way in mind body and spirit and on arrival at bethany the town of his friends mary martha and lazarus he allows a woman from the street to anoint him with oil and as his friends question the people he allows to be associated with, he reminds them that those who are well have no need of a doctor, only the sick. And this woman loved him so much because it was in response to Jesus' love for her first. And in that sense, she could be representing all of us. We can ask, how, how much do we realise that we're called 
to love God because we were loved first by him. And that he's asking us to follow him by following Jesus, to trust him that it will be all right. And that's what he would have been trying to impart on those disciples back then. But for one, it wasn't all right, was it? For Joseph, Judas, the passive nature of Jesus's leadership and authority was nothing less than betrayal. Where were the armies that were going to overturn the Romans who had been oppressing them for years? Where was the revolution to end all revolutions? Where was the freedom that would come once and for all? And as we reflected on yesterday, in that moment of sheer frustration and greed and anger, the deed was done. Authorities tipped off for 30 pieces of silver and the writing was on the wall and quite clear. Jesus' days will be numbered as the plot thickens and evidence mounts for the arrest and sure death of him. So now here we are. It's the day of Passover. The disciples had followed Jesus' instructions and had procured a room which they would share the Passover meal with their master and Lord. And we pause there to, write, to read the scripture reading it is taken from the Gospel of St John, chapter 13. It says this. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during the supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, he got up from the table. He took off his outer robe and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, You do not know what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you your feet, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, One who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet but is entirely clear, clean, and you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. And for this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. So here we are. This is the night where everything would become understood, where the history of God's people would be known in the present moment. And the present moment would then be embedded in the future moments that would come through the remembering of all that Jesus did and asked his followers to do, through the sharing of the bread and wine of Passover in remembrance of him. What Jesus did and who Jesus was would become symbolically known in his act of fellowship remembering. A community of communities would grow from that moment. But before this meal, Jesus did something else. He took off his outer robe, as we have just heard, tied a towel around him and washed his disciples' feet. A simple act of love. We can ask ourselves, have we ever been moved by a simple act of love that we've received? A simple act of love that we have offered? What did it feel like? I 
wonder what it would have been like then. There is an intimacy, isn't there, about someone touching your feet. Those feet would have been weathered and tired and dirty and gnarled. I wonder what they would have felt like as he washed their feet, as he looked up at them, with his eyes looking at them, gazing at them. What would they be saying? Probably, I love you. I will make you clean. I will soothe your feet. And in doing that, I will soothe your tired soul. I will make you well. But the moment was gone because there's always one and it's Peter again. He protests, you will never wash my feet. Buffoon Peter, self-confessed, unworthy follower. Indeed, when Jesus approached him right at the beginning, a few years back, he said, go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. He felt unworthy. Have you ever said to Jesus, go away? I'm not good enough for you. Have you ever felt unworthy? That you couldn't be loved? To be chosen, that's the thing. It isn't so much that we choose to follow Jesus, that we choose to love him. Rather, we are chosen. And once we're chosen, things are never the same again. Longing for something that was missing when we choose not to follow him. Maybe that's what's missing. So Peter, the rock here, not much of a rock thus far. He was one who had glimpsed the true person of Jesus earlier. He wasn't a rabbi to him or a teacher, but he was the Messiah, the anointed one. It didn't matter that the others derided him. He knew and Jesus knew. Jesus knew what Peter knew. And Jesus knew what Peter would become. The head of the church. But right now, Huffley succumbing to having his feet washed he then has to get his head around the message Jesus would then give them that he will be betrayed, rejected and killed. Peter, like Judas, didn't want to see his Lord, his Messiah like that, vulnerable, beaten. Something other than the heroic vision that he had about his leader. This wasn't the story that heroes are made of. Heroes of the world, that is. Because Jesus was no ordinary man. He was no ordinary hero. And he wasn't going to be lured into the world by worldly thinking. He had said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. He was not going to be sidetracked from the journey that he was taken, taking. He knew what he was doing. He knew where he was going. And he knew who he would be betrayed by. But despite that, he washed 12 pairs of feet the feet of his betrayer were just as important to him as the other eleven. Love one another was the message of the day, of that night. Imagine him saying to you, love one another as I have loved you. Could you or I say, I love like that? 
Could you wash the feet of the betrayer? By this everyone will know you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And that is what true love looks like. And that is what Jesus did. He showed us how to love the unlovely. And so, after they washed their feet, they gathered together bread and wine on the table. And this is what happened. The account here taken from the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 26. While they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread and after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup and after giving thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will never again drink of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung the hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So there we were gathered, bread and wine on the table, ordinary bread and ordinary wine blessed each time before and they've eaten together before but I wonder about that night as they kept Passover together a joyful occasion remember I wonder whether it would have felt different because it was have you ever had that time where you're in a room full of people or even a small gathering and there's just something about the atmosphere. There's something not revealed. There's something going on and you're not quite sure. And on that night they would have remembered their ancestors. That's what Passover was about, being set free from the Egyptians by marking their doors with the blood of the lamb, the sacrificial lamb, and so that the angel of death would pass over them. And those disciples then would never have known that they were bringing that past story into the present of that night, that the Moses of those days would become the Jesus of the now both delivering people from bondage and slavery, one physically and the other spiritually. And what they didn't realize then was that this Jesus, this enigmatic character was truly the way, the truth and the life. He was the outside vision of an inward reality that life could only be lived fully when it was lived through love. That was the message. It was the only way. An outward action of love that followed an inward action of love of the heart. What a message and what a messenger. So the bread was raised, fruit of the earth, work of human hands, raised in thanksgiving to God. The bread was broken, torn in two, arms stretched out wide. So wide probably that they might have felt that they were being embraced in that moment. Every single one of them. And there we have it. Jesus' arms outstretched, vulnerable, 
take, eat. This is my body which is given for you, for you. And then the wine, the cup was raised, fruit of the vine, drink this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. He would have been looking at them, knowing each one by name. This is my body. This is my blood. Imagine him handing you the cup, the cup of salvation, the cup of peace. What would you want to say to him? What would you say to him? And it was then that perhaps they remembered. They remembered their scripture. They would have known that well. They remembered that Israel was known as a vine, that their God was the vine dresser, the pruner of the old wood and bad fruit, cutting away until the new shoots could find their way into the sunlight, to be touched by air and light and water, the elements of life, so that they could grow and flourish. And that's what they were expecting. That's what they were experiencing and they couldn't quite put their finger on what it was they were experiencing. But they were experiencing this vine dresser who was Jesus. They were being pruned and nurtured and had been for the past three years or so the dead wood of humanity was being cut back so that new shoots could find their way into the sunlight to be touched by air and the water like a breath, like the water of life, eternal life. I am the light of the world. I am the way and the truth and the life. Jesus has always been the light of the world and the way and the truth and the life. But this night at this meal, they really experienced what that meant. That God in and through Jesus is an experience. It's not a theory. It's not a hearsay. It's a personal experience. Jesus is the vine and the vine dresser. They were the branches, branches that would wither and die if they were cut away from their vine. If they were cut away from their Jesus. Moses and the people back then had been given manna from heaven, but they died. But the bread that was the body of Jesus was the bread of eternal life, living bread from heaven. Something new was happening. Something changed. And everyone knew it. They could feel it. They were witnessing it. That is everyone except Jesus. So he went out into the night, disillusioned, with a sense of betrayal. And he betrayed him. This day was ending, a new covenant made, a new contract of love. Binding love would have made. A contract not of law, but of grace. A gift of grace, of love. 
bread eaten, wine drunk. The meal had ended. Jesus got up and led the way. Where he was going and where they were to follow, they weren't sure. What was happening? They weren't sure of that either. But it didn't matter. Jesus got up and led the way. And they followed him, even into the darkness of the night. And at this time, caught up in the darkness of our pandemic, our global pandemic, what is all this saying to you today? Will you get up and follow Jesus into the night, into the unknown, in trust and faith and love? Is this saying something to you? If you've trodden Holy Week path before, is this familiar ground? this time round? Or is the path less familiar? Leading somewhere unknown? And if this is a new journey for you during this week before Easter, how does the land lie with you on this road? Does it feel safe? Does it feel sure? Does it feel new? It felt new to me not so long ago. But I came to learn that feeling strange, feeling scary, feeling confused is all a part of it being new. Not wrong, not bad, just new. So we leave this scene now. We are following Jesus into the night. And we will see where the path leads tomorrow. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Because by your holy cross, you have redeemed the world. And a prayer for the world, and especially a world caught up in the coronavirus pandemic. God of compassion, be close to those who are ill, afraid, or in isolation. In their loneliness be their consolation, in their anxiety be their hope, in their darkness be their light. Enfold those who have died within your eternal peace and rest and comfort their loved ones who mourn. We ask this through him who suffered alone, alone on the cross, but reigns with you in glory Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Jesus.